welcome to the 24-hour conference on global organized crime podcast from the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime. I'm Jack Megan Vickers. The 24-hour conference on global organized crime took place online in November 2020 and was organized by the European Consortium of Political Research Standing Group, the Centre for Information and Research on Organized Crime, the International Association for the Study of Organised Crime and the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organised Crime. Hundreds of academics, researchers, journalists and others from around the world gathered together to present and discuss the latest research in organised crime. We've selected just 14 of them for this podcast series. But I would encourage you to head over to the website oc24.globalinitiative.net where you can find recordings of other sessions. In this episode, you'll hear the session Disrupting Drug and Counterfeit Supply Chains. Hello, everyone. My name is Leila Hashemi. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the Terrorism, Transnational Crime and Corruption Center at George Mason University, and it's a pleasure to be your moderator today. Thank you for joining us and welcome everyone to session 8A, our regular panel titled Disrupting Drug and Counterfeit Supply Chains. In a moment, I'll introduce our incredible panel of experts. Before I get started, I'd like to remind everyone in the audience to please mute yourselves. Our panel is scheduled for 75 minutes. First, each presenter will have 10 minutes for opening remarks. I'll then pose a few questions and ask each panelist to provide a short response. Next, we'll address audience questions. While we won't get to the Q&A portion till the end, I encourage you to post your questions in the chat which I'll be monitoring throughout the session. Please post your full question in the chat, and unless you state a strong preference for asking the question yourself, I will read all audience questions for our panelists to avoid any technical issues. With this housekeeping out of the way, let's move forward with this exciting and timely panel. This panel focuses on the operations of illicit actors in the cyber world, in both the open and dark web and the supply chains and payment systems for online drug sales, counterfeit pharmaceuticals, and personal protective equipment. Research conducted on these supply chains reveals the wide availability of counterfeit pharmaceuticals and the convergence of these websites with those for opioids and counterfeit equipment and vaccines during the pandemic. Increased demand for PPE has created fertile ground for the production and sale of counterfeit goods. Illicit supply chains of medical products pose unprecedented risks to public health and security. Today, our expert panelists will discuss their research on counterfeit drugs and PPE, which has recently been funded by a five-year National Science Foundation grant titled Collaborative Research, an Interdisciplinary Approach to Understanding, Modeling, and Disrupting Drug and Counterfeit Illicit Supply Chains. I'm delighted to introduce our three speakers. Dr. Louise Shelley is the Omar L. and Nancy Hurst Endowed Chair and University Professor at the Schar School of Policy and Government, George Mason University. She directs the Terrorism, Transnational Crime and Corruption Center that she founded. Her newest book, written with support from the Carnegie Corporation and Rockefeller Foundation Bellagio Fellowship, Dark Commerce, How a New Illicit Economy is Threatening Our Future on Illicit Trade, New Technology and Sustainability, was published with Princeton University Press in 2018. Dr. Edward Huang is an associate professor in the Department of Systems Engineering and Operations Research at George Mason University. He received his MS and PhD degrees in Industrial and Systems Engineering from the Georgia Institute of Technology and his BS and MS degrees from the National Tsinghua University. His research focuses on supply chain analysis, and he has been the PI and co-PI of several projects funded by NSF and other organizations. And last but certainly not least, Dr. Damon McCoy is an associate professor in computer science and engineering at New York University Tandon School of Engineering. His research focuses on empirically measuring the security and privacy of technology systems and their intersections with society. He received his PhD, MS, and BS in computer science from the University of Colorado, Boulder. And now we'll turn to Dr. Shelley. It's a delight to be with you. And I'm very happy to present this panel that represents the beginning of a long research project to understand how crime is operating, particularly in in the cyber world. And as I've heard today about the changes that are going on as we 
face the COVID epidemic and how the criminals are doing new things, I would say that what our research is informed by is many years of research in which Damon, for example, has been looking at online platforms for pharmaceuticals, publishing on this eight years ago. So what we're, we're seeing is an adaptation to the present environment, but not a new phenomenon. So as we think of the present, we face threats not only from the disease of COVID-19, but by sellers seeking to deceive medical providers and ordinary citizens seeking to prevent themselves from the disease. And we're going to hear later from Edward Huang about the very elaborate illicit supply chains that are getting these counterfeit PPE and medicines that do not protect users into the, the supply chains that reach us and reach many other countries in the world. And so this criminal activity is one that is exacerbating the pandemic and is profitable for them, but undermines human health in a very serious way. We, this whole team has done research in both the open web and the dark web, but our research, as we'll go on to explain to you more, shows that much of this trade is going on in the open web. Because as dark commerce has, the, the book that I wrote two years ago explained that criminals prefer to use the open web when they want to reach the largest possible audience. And with many people needing protection in these days, um, there is not a desire to re restrict one's audience. Um, Damon will talk subsequently about the research that has gone on in the dark web in reference to PPE and other counterfeit medicines, but we all believe that this is a relatively small portion of the, of the, the market. And what we need to look at is the open market that is selling um, these counterfeit goods. But much of this is going on on websites that are already known to people who are looking at problem websites in the pharmaceutical industry that some of them are what could be called rogue websites that are totally unregistered anywhere in the world that have no guidelines of any kind of the pharmaceuticals that they're selling. And that's why they're called rogue. Um, they're not registered anywhere. They presume and pretend to be based in some country where they're not based, and they become credible to, to buyers because of their presentations on their websites. But there is nothing that should be credible about them. And these online pharmaceuticals, as I'll show you in a minute, sell counterfeit deferred medicines, often without a prescription, even though a prescription should be provided to purchase these medicines. And um, the last panel that I was hearing on the A channel was dealing with online drug trade. And this phenomenon that we're looking at is not sui generis. Some of these websites as we're going to see that are um, involved in selling counterfeit PPE have also been involved in selling fentanyl. So there's a convergence of many of these phenomena in the cyber world. One of my concerns since I've been on this conference since eight o'clock in the morning is that we keep talking about organized crime. But many of the people that we're looking at for this study that we have embarked on, on counterfeit PPE are not what we would consider organized crime. They might be what you could call criminal entrepreneurs. Some of them are corrupt businesses. And some of this sale is being facilitated by state-owned businesses. The money is going through state-owned banks and we have other state actors. So we are not looking at a phenomenon that is solely existing in the criminal world or happens to intersect with the legitimate world because it is going on through online platforms that are not in the dark web. There are many more points of intersection 
with the legitimate economy and many high status individuals involved in this illicit trade. And it converges, unfortunately, with significant parts of the legitimate economy. Next slide. So this is a slide from a company called Legit Script that has spent much of the last decade or more than that studying online inter internet pharmacies, finding which ones are credible, which ones are not, doing network analysis of them and finding out who is behind this illicit trade. So they have a, um, a database of literally hundreds of thousands of websites and their research shows that at any one time, there are 30 to 35,000 internet pharmacies that are online, but these are not all 30 to 35,000 businesses. There are, as there are probably two to 3,000 merchants that have multiple websites through which they're selling. And it is through this internet pharmacies that are studied here that one finds where the online counterfeit PPE has been added. Some of them sell narcotics, but it is a, a known community that is involved in this activity. And that's part of what our research is looking at is to try and understand how illicit supply chains work and where they converge with the legitimate economy and to be doing um, complex data analytics that helps us understand this phenomenon. So we bring together a, a diverse team to achieve these results. Thank you, next slide. So our research suggests that unlike legal supply chains, which try to be the most efficient possible and cut out middlemen. Our research so far has suggested that intermediary countries are often used to disguise the origin of the substandard and counterfeit masks. As I mentioned earlier, the open web is a much more significant element of this trade than the dark web because of the massive demand for this. And as Edward is going to point out to you, there is not one model of this illicit supply chain. There are diverse models of illicit supply chains. Unfortunately, there is not much literature that exists among experts on supply chains on what an illicit supply chain looks like. And that's, we hope will be one of our major contributions to this work. And there are also multiple business models that are used by these entrepreneurs to evade detection. So they are very much aware that people are on the lookout for them and they try and obfuscate and move through front companies. Sometimes they use cryptocurrencies, but different ways that prevent people from understanding how these supply chains work and cutting them off at their critical nodes. So I next we'll go on and we'll have, turn to Edward who's gonna talk about how these supply chains work for medical masks using some interesting case studies that are now being investigated overseas. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sherry. Uh, in the following slide, I will introduce the, um, the supply chain for the um, surgical mask. Um, I'm uh, Edward Huang, I'm associate professor from George Mason. So right now we will use one example, say a uh, surgical mask, and then we will see their physical supply chain. So for the following slide, I will focus more on the physical side. Let's say how these manufacturing produces, um, let's say the surgical mask, uh, how do they distribute to the hospital and to the end user. Um, as you can see this slide, um, let's say this is a very high level diagram. Uh, we didn't show the detail, you know, some of them like the for, uh, for, for order, broker, you know, the custom, we are not showing here because in the later on, we don't want to, you know, make the, the, like a, the, this diagram very complicated. But as you can see in practice, um, all these factories, they need to import a lot of material from other countries. 
For example, if you see the surgical mask, some like the middle layer, which is the most important one, they will be produced, uh, they will use a material called uh, polypop polypropylene. Um, that layer is very unique. So sometimes they, that will be the bottleneck of the whole supply chain. So in fact, this is not just um, the whole supply chain is part of it. It's like the factory, when they get all the material, they can um, produce it, then they can distribute it. So for the following slide, I will introduce the six type of the criminal case we collect so far. So we do um, we collect different kinds of cases, and then a lot of them come from uh, Taiwan government. They report different kinds of counterfeit uh, surgical mask case. And uh, we will see like uh, how these, let's say, criminals um, try to uh, put their, let's say, uh, defected mask uh, into the, um, I would say, the legal supply chain and then become uh, like, uh, even though we buy the surgical mask, we don't know where it come from. And we may also buy the counterfeit uh, mask through the whole supply chain. So next slide, please. So right now, this is the first one um, case, uh, the case type we, we have to see so far. Um, the case one is we see a lot of a um, factory. In fact, uh, they produce defective mask, but do they do it on purpose? Some of them they did. Why? Because all these factory, the manufacturer, they want to earn money. So for them, um, they say if they want to produce mask, there are two key things in the whole supply chain. First one, they need to get the critical material. That's the a polypropylene a thing. That material, they, they need to purchase it from out, uh, other country or even like uh, usually that is difficult to get. Another one is welding machine. Welding machine is a very high tech uh, uh, machine. Only few country, only few company around the world can produce that kind of a machine. So these two things make like uh, the, we can see like a whole surgical mask, uh, they always have a capacity. We cannot produce as many as we want because the material can be an issue, factory is an issue. So we can see so many factory, they don't have this kind of material or they don't have that kind of machine, then they still want to earn the money. So in this case, they will produce, they may not put the correct filter, they may just put the cotton and then just pretend as like a three layer mask, surgical mask, and then enter to the uh, legal supply chain. For the host, wholesaler in the beginning, they don't know, they just know I cannot buy any surgical mask. Some company can provide it, and then at later on when I buy it, in the later stage, I recognize that this is not the correct surgical mask. But at that moment, I may already distribute all these masks to my downstream customer. It can be the end user, can be the hospital. So this is one type of investigation case we have seen so far. Um, next slide, please. The second case is we also see another, um, we call the holding and the price uh, manipulation. Um, I mean, we see several cases like the wholesaler, they also want to earn more money, right? So in this case, if they have any goods, usually they will sign a long-term contract with the health provider, like a hospital. So for that, uh, let's say the long-term contract, they may say, oh, this is surgical mask, um, you will order a lot of goods and then it's a yearly contract um, or like the 10 year contract, there's something like that, the long-term contract. So that uh, surgical mask is always low price. So like the number we get, some of them like a mask, they may say, oh, one surgical mask just costs around one cent, uh, between one cent and two cent, right? So like 1.7 cents. So it's relatively cheap surgical mask. So when the pandemic happened, they know like, oh, I have that contract. Right now, if I have a surgical mask, if I follow that long-term contract to the hospital, I will lose my money because right now, this mask is like a gold. If I sell to other people, I can get more money. So what they did is they talked to this hospital and then say, yeah, you know what, um, I mean, I don't have any goods. So I cannot you know, deliver these goods to you because my supplier cannot give me all these kinds of a mask. So they try not to give the goods to the hospital, to the health provider. So health provider cannot get the mask. 
In the meantime, they sell to other retailer, bigger retailer. But when they sell to the other retailer, they can increase the price. So as you can see right now, this is not a long-term contract. So they can just pretend that there is no such long-term contract. They sell to the retailer. And then that mass can cost uh, 70 cents, nearly 10 times of the original price. And then for this retailer, they can do the another thing. They say, yes, right now, most people cannot buy the mask. So I can increase again. So that for the end user, you may buy something like the 70 cents per surgical mask. So you can see like this is the second type of the, uh, the case we, saw, uh, we see. The wholesaler, they may holding all these masks do not uh, deliver to their downstream. They want to make sure the price is good then they will sell it. And then in the meantime, they may also try to find a better price so that all these kind of a distribution become a big issue. Next slide, please. Then we also see another type of a case that uh, the company, they may try to import defective masks. Um, uh, as you may know, let's say all these surgical masks, right now China is the major, I would say, exporter. Um, nearly 50% of the masks are produced from China. So right now we can see a lot of a factory, even though they may, may operate in other country, can be in uh, Vietnam or Taiwan. What they did is they have another factory in China. So it's pretty like a, you have a, they have a multiple factory. Then in this case, they play a game that, uh, okay, um, some maybe the, let's say my another factory in, Thai, uh, in, in China, they didn't produce uh, like the high quality medical um, mask, but I can import it just as soon as this is a non-medical mask. And they come to my factory and then I can tell my labor, say, hey, right now, um, you just trade them as the final product because no one knows where it come from. You only get that these, they, they can do like a relabeling, repackaging, and then that kind of thing. Then they can enter to the legitimate supply chain, send it to the wholesaler, hospital, retailer, and user. So they all don't know like, in fact, you didn't get the surgical, like I'm mean, the correct a surgical mask from your supplier. But this is like they did it on purpose because in this case, they can earn a lot of money from this. Next slide, please. Another case we see is like the non-approval factories. Usually these surgical masks, uh, this is a factory, they need a license to produce this medical product. And then uh, during the pandemic, we see, um, I mean, se several cases that uh, game, game group, they see like, uh, wow, in the beginning, they may sell the drugs. Right now they say, yeah, drug, I, I may not get the drug right now. And then people don't leave their house. So it's difficult to, to sell the drug. So instead, they also produce masks, but they cannot get the license. So what they did is they may produce a defective mask. They try to get the machine or even just use labor. In some cases, we found that this game group, they operated the mask factory and then they were run it 24 hours, seven days, nonstop. They always produce, use all these labor and then try to produce all these masks because at that moment, they can earn a lot of money from this factory. So we also see a lot of, a fact, uh, I mean, uh, non-approval factory also produce this is a surgical mask but the, you know this kind of a mask is usually is defective next slide please another one is we also see like the wholesaler over factories uh, let me change the product label one uh, one um let's say like in a factory or wholesaler sometimes some if they try to like the um do some illicit activity, they may just hire some people, change the label. Let's say like a, they may have a, some, um, let's say the um, a factory in the free zone, that kind of thing. Then they can change the label from the medical and non-medical mask become the medical mask, that kind of thing. If they don't be in cut, then they can make sure that their product will become higher price. Non-medical mask and the medical mask the price gap is huge. So they know if they change the product label or they change the production, they said original, like oh, made in China, change to made in Yunnan or made in Taiwan, made in Japan, the price will go up a lot. 
so that they do this kind of a thing, either in the factory side or the wholesaler side. So we can see this kind of a case. Next slide, please. Another one, we see the international mask of uh, fraud uh, cases uh, around the uh, uh, around different country. Um, let's say for all these during the pandemic, um, I mean, according to the OECD, we can see like uh, all, all the country, they, they still need to like uh, trade between different country. Although, on, you know, based on the data, we know Germany is a large export uh, country to sell all these uh, COVID-19 goods. United States is the largest importer, okay, importer country uh, around the world. But in fact, if you compare all of them, all these international trade is still on. Although Germans sell a lot of goods, but I mean, based on the report, um, every one dollar they, they, they export, they also import 90 at uh, 72 cents. So you can see all these goods, you need to buy the material, make the final product, then you can sell it to the other country. So we see a lot of, let's say, uh, criminal cases. How they did is very simple. They just say, okay, right now I need to buy from other country. One case I think as we see is like the United States at that moment, we need to buy a lot of uh, N95 mask. And then they contact Taiwan broker say, can you find any, let's say N95 mask? And it's clear we cannot buy anything from, uh, from Taiwan. At that moment, these, uh, I mean, the U.S. Uh, company, they, read, they, they searched the website and then they said, wow, there is one European company. They, can, they have an N95 and then they can sell it to us. So they actually pay the money, but they never receive all this money because all the website is fake. There is no such good, there is no standard. And um, I mean, they, they don't have the actual you know, physical thing. So we, all, we also see another kind of a cases related to international ma mask uh, fraud. So this is another uh, type of the, um, let's say investigation case we have seen so far. So this is like the, we, we summarize six different um, cases. And then for the next slide, um, I will introduce like the, the, it's clear, these are all the supply chain physical flow. How can we use the, let's say classical supply chain analytics approach, collecting the data and then try to prevent, try to protect our um, physical mask. So next slide, please. In the supply chain anal and analytics, usually one thing we do is the distribution plan. The distribution plan is usually like the, when we see when, when the goods, let's say after, um, after they pass the custom and then the wholesaler receive the goods, they need to define their, like the, how do they distribute it? Should I find the third party logistic? Where should I ship? Should I ship to the uh, hospital? Should I ship to the retailer? How do I hold all these goods in my warehouse? All these kind of distribution plan, if we have this kind of data, in fact, we can prevent they do the, the price manipulation or uh, holding. But the key issue is this company, let's say the wholesaler or retailer, in most cases, they want to keep their data in-house. They don't want to pop, you know, let other people to see their data because this is their business intelligence. If that is available, then uh, that can become a difficult thing. So if we need to know all of these kinds of let's say, distribution plan, we may need to collect any point to see what's their relationship for whole distribution. Next slide, please. And then um, from the factory side, factory planning for all these countries, let's say they, and the mask, your, uh, the supplier, they have their own production schedule. Usually we call the master production schedule. From that, you will know like, oh, where do they get the material? How do they produce it? Do they de uh, produce the defective goods, that kind of thing? And then what's their production schedule? Same thing here. If we know this kind of information, we can, we can identify like the product label change or do they actually have that kind of a lab factory. But the detection, this, uh, this kind of a criminal is always um, I would say expensive. You need to like the frequently go to the factory, like the case we see, they need to visit the factory, make sure they still follow the standard, make sure all these masks are still very um, maintain the correct uh, standard. Next slide, please. 
Another, let's say, analytics we see so far will be the logistic planning. I think this can be um, not very expensive, but very powerful. Um, right now, we see so many cases, how they detected this criminal activity, they check both their critical material and the, the final product. Let's say if they import something from other country, okay, the key material or a key machine, and if we know this kind of information, we can use that information to match the final product, how many masks they produce per week. And it's clear if they don't get enough key material, there is no way they can produce enough mask. So that number must match. So we can, uh, we see a lot of investigation. They did is like they check the, the key material, the, the filter, uh, uh, poly, 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 uh, that filter. They say, oh, how many, uh, how many, they say, uh, shield, do you get it? And then we can see like how many masks you produce by day. So they can do this kind of calculation, make sure that they, the, the factory doesn't do like the um, defective goods. This kind of thing can come, the data can come from the custom. And uh, I mean, uh, then uh, the key question will be, can we match based on the, you know, like the bill of lending data, how can we match this? So this is like the, right now we see three possible supply chain analytics. We see like a, the investigation um, department use to identify all these counterfeiting goods. And then this will be the, my last slide. So right now I will go back to uh, to the moderate. Thank you very much, Edward. Next we have uh, Damon, Damon McCoy. Hi everyone. Um, so yeah, so I'm gonna kind of counter, you know, um, what's going on and kind of the more open markets what's with what's happening in the more underground markets here. So these are kind of some preliminary findings from this really massive joint study that we did of um, what are typically called the dark markets or you know the dark web markets within your sizzle was done in collaboration with some collaborators from universities in London, um, Oxford. We had our industry collaborator from Flashpoint, which is a kind of threat intelligence company in New York here, and um, my grad student Max as well. So next slide. So the focus of the study was in trying to find you know, COVID-related goods on these dark websites. But for those of you, most of you are probably familiar with these dark websites. Um, the original one of these was called Silk Road. It specialized in selling drugs, you know, marijuana, opioids, ecstasy, and things of that nature when they're basically recreational drugs. Um, it right was taken down by you know, the joint investigation by the FBI and the Secret Service. And in its place, a whole bunch of other of these dark markets have cropped up within here. So um, today there's, you know, it, it kind of rotates. The, the Dutch police and things like that have also taken down these marketplaces within here. They're a little bit hard to take down. They, they hide their location by using Tor within there. And then, right, all their payments are done through cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin and Ethereum and things like that. Um, the listings on these sites are, you know, they look similar to what you'd see on like a site like eBay or something like that, right? They kind of have the title description of what they're selling. In this case, one of the anti-malaria drugs um, that was thought to you know, potentially be a treatment to COVID-19. And then, right, they have, you know, the vendor that's selling it, the price, um, the description, kind of freeform text within there, and then some shipping information within there. So um, again, the majority of what's sold on these sites are you know, recreational drugs within there, but we thought that this might be a place where um, you know, COVID-related items were sold. And so we built up a big keyword search of these COVID-related items. Next slide, please. And through our industrial collaborator at Flashpoint, Ian, um, we got access to essentially scrape data from, I believe it was over 20 of these dark web marketplaces within here, pretty much all the major active ones 
more than your um some of these specialize in other things like guns and items like that and so we didn't expect to see any covid related goods on those types of sites um based on our keyword searching within here we found covid related listings on seven of the dark markets these were normally the major ones that focused more on the recreational drugs within your so um from the scrape data that spanned about 100 days pretty much from Know, the the beginnings of COVID-19 all the way up to um, kind of, I think, May or June timeframe within year was kind of our initial analysis within year. And so um, we did in fact find some listings for COVID-19 related goods. We found 518 of them. So, you know, a few, but not many. Within year, our breakdown and analysis of the goods that we found from these dark marketplaces showed that you know, PPE was the most popular type of listing. So gloves, gowns, masks, N95 masks, things like that started appearing on these dark market sites. Um, medicine started appearing on these sites. Predominantly it was the, the more commonly available medicines that were you know, thought to potentially be treatments to COVID. So things like the anti-malaria drugs and things like that. However, we did see um, two listings for, I believe it's pronounced Remdesivir. So this was actually a drug that, you know, trials have shown is effective at treating COVID-19. However, it's in very limited supply within here. So this might have been an instance of supply diversion of you know, a drug that's in incredibly short supply at this point that was being diverted to these dark net markets within here. So this was, this was kind of interesting and unfortunate that there was this potential supply diversion happening with here. However, um, again, this has to be taken with a grain of salt, right? We don't know if these drugs are actually the legitimate formulations of these drugs or whether they're saline solution or who knows what they might be within here, but there's at least people claiming that they have access to this drug that's in critical, these short supply within here. Um, we also found a few of what we called medical frauds within here. So these were listings of claiming some kind of anecdote, which as far as I know, doesn't exist. And if it did exist, you know, they would be making billions of dollars. <laughs> At this point, um, there were some vaccines that were being sold a lot of them didn't specify what type of vaccine it was. So it was unclear again, this might be supply diversion where perhaps you know, some of the um, vaccines that are undergoing testing currently might be getting diverted, some of their supply and being sold on these dark markets within here. Um, so we found a few of these, again, not many of them, I think like three or four listings for these vaccines. And then we found kind of the majority of it was um, just simply kind of disinformation. So, you know, combinations of normally recreational drugs that they were claiming would you know, be curative for COVID-19 within here. So maybe some of this was just kind of in jest, unclear within there. And then we saw some listings for you know, um, diagnosis and tests as well. Again, potentially supply chain diversion because right, um, during the time when we were doing this, these were again in kind of critically short supply in much of the world within there. And then interestingly enough, um, we did find two listings for medical ventilators within here. Again, no ground truth as to whether they would actually deliver a functioning medical ventilator, but there were some people listing these on here um, within here. So these were, this is kind of the breakdown of what we found within here. So again, in total, um, 518 of these. We also looked for listings that just simply mentioned COVID-19. And I think we found um, far more of these within here. I believe that we found close to 20,000 of these. However, when we did our manual analysis of these, we found that most of these were um, the recreational drugs and people mentioning that they might not be able to ship it to some places because of the shipping disruptions that happened, you know, that are still occurring probably because of COVID-19 infection within here. So the majority of these COVID-19 mentions were not 
COVID related products. They were just simply mentioning that COVID-19 had affected some part of the predominantly recreational um, drug supply chains that they had existing within there. Um, we have a paper that is available online. You could see the title of and you can find it by Googling and you could see some more of our analysis. We did things like you know, looking at the pricing for these. Of course, the cheapest ones were the PPE gear. Um, they had prices kind of equivalent to what Edward was showing you for retail mass, uh, slightly elevated sometimes, so probably about you know, a few dollars per mask or things like that. So, you know, absolute ripoff prices compared to what you would pay wholesale, but pretty much in line with you know, the price gouging that was going on in the clear web for these types of supplies within there. Um, obviously the ventilators were the most expensive goods that we saw within there. And then the rest kind of fell in between those two price points within there. And then we also have a breakdown of you know, which dark markets were listing which products and which vendors were listing them. And things of that nature as well within there. I didn't include all those details because I kind of wanted to keep it short to allow for as much Q&A as possible. Um, next slide. Thank you. Yep. <laughs> Got the timing. Um, so yeah, so we, we also, another interesting thing was looking at the kind of longitudinal evolution of how these COVID related goods were being listed on these sites within here. So that first figure, um, the orange and the blue one, apologies for the colorblind people, within here, hopefully the dotted and dashed lines will help you, kind of shows you know, a timeline of how these started appearing Within year, again, right, there were many more listings that simply just mentioned COVID-19 than were actually you know, selling specific products for COVID-19. So we can see at the beginning, you know, when we first got the original reports out of Wuhan, and then that, that there was pretty much no activity within year. And um, the first signs of activity were, I believe that there were a few when it spread to Italy, and then right when it hit New York City, unfortunately where I live, that's when it really started to ramp up. And then right as the infection started to ramp up, the um, listings started to ramp up as well within here. Um, if you look at the other one, the, the green red one here, this is only the, the COVID you know, specific listings within here. And so um, we plotted these we separated them. So the green is the PPE, the red is the medicines within here. And each of these dashed lines is basically um, Trump tweeting about COVID within here. And so again, as we can see, you know, there's pretty much no activity. Um, you start seeing a little bit of PPE within here. And then right as Trump kind of starts tweeting, it starts to kind of ramp up the PPE within here, and then the medicines also kind of ramp up. And then, right, they kind of, you know, continue the ramp up, and then they start kind of falling off towards the end within here, presumably when you know, there was less um, shortages in the supply chains within here. However, the medicines kind of stay solid. Those, right, have continued to be in short supply throughout the pandemic unfortunately, where the PPE is in, you know, slightly less short supply at this point. So these were kind of longitudinally what we found here. Um, we're continuing to collect the data and process it. We're kind of waiting until there's a vaccine that's been approved. And we expect at that point that we'll see a lot of activity, you know, presumably that vaccine will unfortunately be in short supply and we'll presumably see some supply diversion at that point of you know, the vaccine or vaccines that are approved will presumably start showing up on these dark marketplaces as well. So that's kind of a summary of our study. Again, I would, we did find some stuff, but I would you know, largely call it kind of a negative result that there was some stuff, but there wasn't a lot of stuff on the dark web market. However, it'll be interesting to see you know, as the vaccines um, get approved, what will happen on these dark markets within there? Will they become you know, 
a larger supply for people that are looking to get a hold of the vaccine before they should within there. Um, so with that, I will hand it back to Layla and we can start a Q&A. Wonderful. Thanks so much. Yeah, thank you to all of our panelists for presenting this important research. It's clear that trade in counterfeits has increased during the pandemic and that these illicit supply chains pose threats to public health and security. I welcome you to ask your questions within the chat, but until we get some questions from the audience, I will ask our panelists some questions of my own. So you've addressed this a little bit in your each of your presentations, but I wanted to ask how is the trade in drugs and counterfeits similar to or different from other forms of transnational crime? I'll, I'll start with that being the, the organized crime person and say that what we've seen in this area is the enormous rise of cyber activity and how online marketplaces and social media have contributed to this growth. And much of our discussion today in, in, the, um, in the many, many panels that we've had has been on a focus on, on territorially based organized crime activity. And what we're looking at in both the rise of drug trade, of pharmaceutical trade, of counterfeits is something that has especially benefited from the online marketplace. And as Edward's presentation was showing, some of this is going on the, the illicit trade in um, PPE is going on through personal connections and people searching for this through known suppliers, but a lot of this is going on of the sales through the online marketplace. So we see in this area of activity that there's much more involvement of factories, um, many of them legitimate factories and not um, sort of pop-up factories as Edward mentioned, and the same thing is true with fentanyl. In research following and, and mapping online websites out of China that are selling fentanyl, much of the fentanyl, almost half of it can be identified with um, established legitimate Chinese companies that are producing this. Thank you. Damon or Edward, did you wanna answer that or should we move to the next question? Uh, I can add a few points to this question. I mean, as we can see from the surgical mask, we feel like uh, right now, if we just see the supply chain, usually these like a uh, defected mask or they do, you know, like uh, this like uh, Ill illegal mask, they just will, they will change the label. They will change the product anyway. Then they will use the formal, let's say, um, classical supply chain, all these goods, how do you import, et cetera. So they will look like the legitimate goods, right? So like, it, so this part is sometimes may not be similar to the drug trafficking because drug trafficking, I mean, they still will like change the package, but the people will know how to do it. But this kind of, let's say, the, like the surgical mask, they just look like the normal, regular surgical mask. So in this case, the supply chain transparency become very important. We are not just know our supplier. So in most cases, we need to know supplier's supplier or even you know more layer so that we can see their relationship. So they have some similarity, but some, sometimes I, I would say that they also have a, a little bit difference. Thank you, wonderful. I see some questions from the audience. So I'll go to those first to prioritize them. So we have a question for Damon McCoy asking, have you observed a regional focus concentration of the listings of counterfeit pharmaceuticals in terms of market outreach? Um, like I said, we, we did do the analysis of it. A lot of them don't provide um, where they're shipping it from or where they would ship it to within there. Um, most of the regional focus, it's similar to the, the recreational drug part of their market within there. So, you know, Western Europe and the US is normally the focus of these dark markets. So it was, it pretty much, I think, mirrored the, the, the original focus of these markets. Wonderful, thank you. And I think a, a final sort of follow up to that is um, from Isabella who asked, just curious in the final slide that the figure that tracks changes in dark web activity listings against Trump Twitter tweets, what were the content of the tweets 
For example, <laughs> denying or downplaying COVID, warning against COVID, becoming infected with COVID, et cetera, um, because I guess you would expect this to impact listings differently. Um, yeah, so right. Most of Trump's original tweets, I believe, were downplaying COVID within there. So yeah, I mean, I'm not sure if the content of his tweets matter as much as probably, you know, kind of him tweeting about it in general. And again, that was kind of you know, just a marker probably of, you know, the, the more broader perception at least in the U.S., of how COVID was trending within there. Wonderful. Thank you. And then we have a question from our very own Jay. Uh, forgive me if you've already answered this question, but given the diversity of counterfeit products and drugs in their sourcing, manufacturing, and transit, how can you be confident of enough similarities to build models that predict, sorry, that provide product level utility for interventions? Given the diversity of counterfeit products, how can you be confident of enough similarities to build models that provide product level utility for interventions? Let me, let me say something and then Edward, I'm sure will have something to say. We know that there are, for these counterfeit products, as um, Edward mentioned, a lot of the PPE is coming out of China and is coming out of Taiwan. And so when we've started to look at the, the supply chain for those goods, we, we, we started there with looking at some of what was, and Edward can comment more on this, but on the um, sort of transshipment through Taiwan and the relationships between Taiwanese factories and China. In fact, there was an online conference that almost all of us attended a few weeks ago on this subject. It was an online conference out of there. Um, on some of the other products that we're looking at, um, in which you're, you're looking at these rogue pharmacies that are advertising online products, those are generally known actors that are operating out of different parts of the world. So that's a different um, set of suppliers. So today, um, when uh, Dina Siegel was talking earlier about Russian groups being involved in, in counterfeit products, some of these websites that have been tagged by people looking at what has been added to counterfeit pharmaceutical companies, these are, are Russians operating through sort of phantom websites, but years of research have unmasked who's behind them and they've added counterfeit PPE. So depending on the commodity you have and, and the proximity to the goods and the supply chains that exist, you're tapping into different parts of the market. India has a lot of um, ge generics that they're producing. And years ago, Damon, when he was doing his phenomenal research on something called pharma leaks found, you know, Russians who were sourcing out of India. And if you go back and look at that slide I showed ver very early on, a lot of these um, rogue pharmacies are also sourcing out of India. So th th there is not one geographic source for this, though the PPE seems to be more concentrated because in, in, in Chinese speaking, region where it is known to be produced there. I'm sure Edward and Damon have more to add. Uh, I can add a few points to this question. I think that's say right now, uh, when we see all these surgical masks, how they like uh, um, analyze the whole supply chain, all they do is they want to get the transparency. So right now, I think that is a wonderful idea. Let's say in, uh, if we want to see, right now we only see the final product, right? We want to analyze that, oh, is this, the, what's the percentage they can be the legitimate goods? Do they have any parts of the, 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 they can be counterfeit? You know, all these parts is already become the final product. We only know my, one component can be, right? So the question is how can we detect all these kind of things? 
And then usually we see like a most approach they did is we call the ABC analysis. What is ABC analysis? The ABC analysis is like, a, if you see the whole product, like Apple, how they control their I, iPhone, say right now this iPhone is wonderful. There is no counterfeiting goods there. What they did is they will based on their value Say right now, oh, for uh, Apple, I know the whole material. Here is the screen, here is the CPU, everything. What is the money I need to pay? And then how much money does my supplier can earn if they use the counterfeiting goods? And then like Apple, what they did is uh, they will buy the equipment. They will buy the material for their supplier. So in this case, they control the most value so that, that they all know like, oh, this is supplier, you must use the material from certain company. I already make the contract for you. So this kind of a model, they can control both sides. Like the factory, they have their supplier, they have the, uh, their customer. So in this case, you we will know like uh, these kind of thing, th this kind of product will be much safer compared to like uh, you authorize everything to your supplier. They, sometimes they will always try to find a lower product they may be the you know labor traffic traffic the product or you know some like the lower price. So this is one kind of a model we try to um, create to analyze to collect the data and then try to figure out all these kind of let's say the key component to final product. How can we match together? How can we analyze their difference? And in this case, we can uh, we can build a probability model to see, yeah, this kind of a, uh, goods is that a good one, or is it, they can be a counterfeiting goods. So right now, this is the ongoing research we we plan to do. Next, yeah, I, I agree with Edward on that. Um, there's always this challenge of kind of you know digging deeper into the supply chain you can kind of you know see that first layer of the supply chain but you really have to do a lot of you know analysis and clever you know, data collection in order to dig deeper into the supply chain but that's really kind of the key part is that digging beneath the surface to understand you know how this illicit supply chain really works and potential disruption points within there because oftentimes when you're getting to kind of the more visible part of the supply chain that's oftentimes the hardest to disrupt of the supply chain kind of intentionally they've kind of hardened that part because that's the part that's exposed to the most analysis within there but the other parts sometimes aren't as hardened and are more disruptable but again they take more effort to expose and understand wonderful thank you we have a question for louise it says, Louise, you mentioned that sellers are not only organized crime, but they involve criminal entrepreneurs, criminal businesses, and are often facilitated by state-owned businesses and state actors. I was wondering if you could elaborate on the presence of state-owned actors and their play, the way they influence the counterfeit supply chain. Okay, thank you. So in some of these, um, and Edward could comment more on this or Layla, to that some of these factories in Taiwan are either receiving subsidies or they're, they're state-sanctioned factories that have been involved in, in this relabeling and the facilitating of counterfeiting. The same thing can be said for some of the sources of the things that are being imported from China into Taiwan. And as we're seeing in, in the pharmaceutical side, we're also having some of these problems going on in, in businesses where you're having entrepreneurs as opposed to criminals, because much of what we've talked about today of criminals that are territorially based, they, are, they, they may engage in racketeering and extortion and take over a business, but they're not usually individuals that set up significant factories. And that's what we need for the production of a lot of this goods in a significant scale. And so this is where we're looking at some companies that are actually working with state subsidies and then are producing things on the side or trying to skim and make, make more money. And so it's, it's a continuum, but it's not your traditional organized crime of which we've been studying, ethnic groups or others that are involved in this. 
And sometimes you're having people importing from suppliers that have set up factories that have no, no, like in India that are not are outside sort of the regulatory process and have not such state certification of products. I can provide one example to this uh, to this question. Um, let's say um, two months ago, we see a very interesting case from Taiwan. Let's say Taiwan government, they want to make sure that they, they can ramp up the, the mask production. They actually sign a contract to different kind of mask factory. Say, hey, this factory, uh, the, all the factory right now, I mean, 70% of your production will own by the by the government. So all these masks, 70% will go to the government and then government will centralize distribute to all the, let's say hospital and end user. So 70%. And then the, in the, that contract is a flat price. They say every mask is around 10 cents. And then, um, and then uh, they say um, you are at 70%, uh, all, 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 all the masks need to go to the, uh, go to the government. In the meantime, the government will buy the key machine and the key material that the filter for all these company. And then in this case, most people will say, yes, this is a stay on right business. And then they will produce the mask. But there is one case that a company, they actually buy the counterfeiting mask from China. And then what they did is they got, they get the key material from the, from the government. But in this case, they produce a high quality mask but they don't give to the government. They sell it on their own. So that's a high quality mask. Don't go to the government because it's a flat price, only 10 cents. If I sell to the end user, I can sell for 20 cents or 30 cents. So what they did is for these counterfeiting goods, they purchased it from China. They changed the label and then just behave like the government on mask. And then they give to the government then all these people will say, oh, this is a government-owned business. And then government gives them the material so they should be safe. But in fact, if we trace all the source, it's come from another country. So that is another one. In the beginning, we think that, okay, they are smart, right? They know how to earn money. So even though they see right now it's become the state-owned, they still can find another path that get, produce a high quality, get a high price. And then low quality mask just give to the government because they cannot, you know, detect all these kinds of a mask. So that's as in some cases we will say yes, they are smart, but then we still need to find a better way to identify this kind of issue and to prevent all these kind of thing. Um, let's say uh, for the for the long term like, uh, production. Yeah, thank you. Also, I think we prevent it so that we're not losing doctors and medical personnel. Right, right. Relying on these. Right. That's right. I think it's also important to point out that there are lots, there's a high level of corruption and collusion that happens in a lot of these states where, um, especially when we come, when we look to sort of transit and shipping. So, you know, working with Customs and Border Patrol or somehow, you know, bribing people to get things across borders, as Edward was mentioning, um, especially because these products are moving across countries. Okay, we have about 10 minutes left. So I've actually posed a few questions. Um, I will ask both if we have time. So what are the most critical changes that we must make to effectively disrupt this trade? I think the first thing I would say, and that's why we have a multidisciplinary team, is you need the data analytics to do this. And you need to combine people who understand about crime and how people evade laws with people with just incredible understanding of supply chains and cyber and online capacity. And if you don't combine these skills, you can't begin to understand the problem and then begin to address the solution. Absolutely, thank you. I'm all about multidisciplinary research and I'm happy to be your colleague. Um, what are the best resources for people who want to dive deeper into this topic and what can individuals attending this webinar do to support your research and investigations? I can I, I can uh, mention this. Um, I mean, right now, let's say when we analyze all these kinds of let's say uh, the say the counterfeiting supply chain, I think it, we we recognize that the data is the key component. Data is a key component. Can come from the website. Can come from the transportation. You know, right now, if we see the physical supply chain, every company 
on a part of the data. If every company just analyze their internal data, we only can, they only see, you know, one part of the supply chain. And then if let's say we have a data hub, let's say, okay, a distribution side, a broker, forwarder, they all share part of the data, then we can construct the whole supply chain. Then this kind of intervention will be very powerful because at that moment, we can see like every actor in the supply chain, what's their relationship to the following one? Is there any illicit activity in that? So for me, the data, data, hub is always the key if we want to learn more about the supply chain transparency. Damon, can you say some more? Because this community is not as cyber sophisticated as you and your most of them, I don't know all of them, as sophisticated as you and your collaborators. Can you begin to tell people where they can find more of this research that they can use that might help um, them understand this phenomenon? Um, yeah, so yeah, so I mean, uh, a decent amount of this research is appearing in you know, the computer science locations, a lot of times in you know, system security venues and things like that. And a lot of it is enabled by partnerships you know, with government and industry people. A lot of the data that you know, allows us to do these studies comes from industry and government sources within here. So, these are, these are oftentimes key to allowing you know, computer scientists with big data processing ability to kind of you know, find the patterns and kind of unravel you know, the signs of these illicit supply chains within here. But a lot of it starts with the data, pointing back to the study that I showed you there, that was enabled right by data that Flashpoint allowed us to analyze within here. And the other big thing is that right, these can be mutually beneficial within here because right, Flashpoint, this, you know, this wasn't kind of a business priority for them to do this particular analysis within here. And so we can provide right, you know, the, the analyst cycles to do these studies that you know, once done kind of help everyone, including you know, Flashpoint that originally provided us with the data within there. So yeah, so th these partnerships are gonna be very critical to us being able to do this research. And again, hopefully it'll be mutually beneficial because right, by combining this data and you know, us providing the analysis, hopefully it'll directly benefit the people that are providing the data and benefit kind of everyone in being able to combat these illicit supply chains, especially you know, in the case of COVID-19 where as Luis was hinting at, right, people's lives might be at stake. I, I think it's important, and I, I'd like to have a little more a discussion on this, is that one of the reasons that our research is funded by NSF is that about two, three years ago, the NSF decided that there is a serious problem of illicit supply, uh, program officer decided in NSF that there's a serious problem that we have an enormous problem of illicit supply chains around the world, but we, all our supply chain analytics is on, is on legitimate supply chains. And therefore we need to think about this, but we needed to combine this with people in other disciplines to help these, you know, the supply chain specialists think about this. And then Damon for quite a number of years when I first met him was working on NSF, had a grant on sort of the greatest challenges for computer science and one of them was the fact that criminals are, were going into cyberspace. And so to do this kind of work, you need really complex collaborations and, and developing a language to collaborate. So this is sort of our beginning. But I think to understand some of the answers to this question, you have to be reading computer science literature, but the computer scientists need to have to be able to explain it in ways like an audience like this understands it. You're laughing, Damon. Can you say a little more on that? No, yeah, at least you're, you're very, you're very correct. You know, the dissemination of the results of our findings are, are very key within there. Um, so, so we, we disseminate them through computer science publications, ideally trying to use, you know, 
as broad and understandable as a language as we can within there. So they oftentimes look very weird to the computer science community because they're not quite written you know, specifically for that community. They're written for a broader community within there. But we also do you know, a lot of outreach to journalists within there to do, again, even more broader dissemination. And then I've also been working with legal scholars. So yes, yeah, so this, this is a really key challenge that you know I've been trying to tackle. And I think this particular grant gives us a good opportunity because of the multidisciplinary nature to you know, get as broad and diverse a dissemination as we can to not just the computer science community, not just the legal community, but to kind of all of these key communities, the industrial communities, the law enforcement communities, the policy communities. So this is a, our plea to you, the audience, and those who will be hearing this because it's now too late in Europe. So we've got, I know we've got Americans, we've got Australians on this. Uh, I don't know who else, but what we really need to do to advance this is to make these communities much more interconnected. And, and the global initiative has been much more territorially based than cyber based. And that's part of why I brought help put this panel together with our team to reach a larger audience and begin a dialogue that I think is really, really necessary. And our research is not that far along, but we've all been doing it. So we sort of brought what we've done that's already probably not known to you. But we need much more help and collaboration and we look forward to hearing from all of you. And maybe Layla can put up our emails again um, in the panel so that, or in the chat box so people can know how to, how to reach us. And we look forward to communicating with you much more. Wonderful, thank you so much. Thank you for really emphasizing the need for collaboration, which I think is really important. And this blending of computer scientists, programmers with social scientists is one of my missions in life for sure. So we are just about wrapping up. Uh, this has been a really lively and informative discussion. I want to once again, thank our amazing panelists for sharing their important research. Thank you to our conference organizers for keeping me on time and everyone in the audience for joining us um, for this session on disrupting drug and counterfeit supply chains. Yeah, so thanks again for joining us. Have a wonderful rest of the conference, everyone. You were listening to Disrupting Drug and Counterfeit Supply Chains. If you'd like to get more information on this topic and the speakers, head over to the conference website, oc24.globalinitiative.net. There you can also find videos of most of the talks, including a number of discussions that are not part of this podcast series. This was the 24-hour conference on Global Organised Crime podcast. I'm Jack Megan Vickers. Thanks for listening. <laughs>